Hello and welcome everybody to another edition of the Saturdays for the Byzantines podcast. I am your host, Professor Wren. Uh, get the disclaimers out of the way, not actually a professor, don't actually have a PhD, not employed by any university, American or otherwise. Okay, now that that's out of the way. Uh, if you're finding this video, please make sure to give it a like, uh, leave a comment in the comment section if you have any questions or anything else that you wanna comment. Uh, we're gonna be reading uh, a couple questions we have here today. Uh, also subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so that you never miss another video. If you are listening on Apple Podcast or Google Plays, please make sure to give us a follow there. And if you're listening on iTunes especially, please give us a five-star review. It really helps the channel or, or the podcast or whatever. Uh, you can find us on Instagram, academics underscore nine five. That's A-C-A-D-E-M-I-X underscore nine five where I post updates about the show and other interesting things about various forms of history that we're covering here, ancient history, medieval history, Byzantine history, so on and so forth. And then you can also find us on Facebook. Uh, check out Professor Wren on Facebook. It will be up there. Um, uh, have I missed anything? Oh, uh, be sure to go check out uh, Eastern Roman history. Uh, he's kindly agreed to give the channel uh, some shout outs. So I agreed, you know, uh, he's helping me out. I'll definitely uh, send the, the viewers that I have here over to his channel. So if you want to go check out Eastern Roman history on YouTube, he does some really good stuff. If you enjoy what I'm talking about, you'll definitely enjoy what he's talking about. So with that out of the way, uh, today we are going to be talking about the big dramatic finale here, uh, the fall of Rome, the 476 fall of Rome, the occupation of Italy by the Ostrogoths. And then we're going to talk a little bit about why exactly is it that Rome falls? There's obviously lots of theories about this. There's, it's been a hotly debated issue basically since it happened. Um, but we're going to take a, a little, a, a bit of a dip into that uh, historiographical conversation. So I think that'll be fun. So without further ado, let's get the show on the road. So where our story picks up, we have uh, two guys who we're basically looking at here. One guy, his name is Rickimer, and the other guy whose name is, oh, I'm sorry. I need, I need to read the comments. So, or the questions. So our, our, uh, we have two questions here from Emperor Atlantis, excellent subscriber. Uh, first question he asks is, he says, I learned that the eventually leaked slash stolen slash discovered secrets of silkworms enabled the Byzantines to make their own silk, but this silk was of inferior quality compared to Chinese silks. Do you know if this is true? Uh, so I don't know a whole lot about whether or not uh, Chinese silk was superior to Byzantine silk, uh, but if you just think about it, I mean, the, kind of the, 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 the way I thought about it when I read this question, is that the Chinese have been making silk for, for centuries by this point in time. And once the uh, silkworms basically get out of China, uh, not by their own accord, of course, they're, they're worms, uh, you know, people smuggle them out of China. Uh, and by the time they get to the Byzantines, you know, they're going to be new to this trade, whereas the Chinese have been at it for, for centuries. So that, that may explain if in fact there was a, a, a disparity in the quality of Byzantine silk versus Chinese silk, that may, that may, be an explanation as, as to why. Uh, Emperor Lantis's second question says, you talk about Justinian spending a lot of money. He is famous for his deeds, but it sounds like the wars and big infrastructure projects also costed a lot of money. And with the arrival of Islamic conquest, their, econ their economic situation gets strained with the loss of Egypt as well as Syria and Palestine. So do you think Justinian left the empire in bad shape because of it? Or am I missing factors in this line of thinking? Uh, so I will, uh, so we'll address this here. Um, you can, we'll, we'll obviously talk a lot more about Justinian when we get to that point in time, but I will say that part, so, so when Justinian 
And, and if you want to hear more about this, go watch my our episode from earlier this week about uh, sixth century Byzantine uh, early early sixth century Byzantine uh, economy. And basically, what I said was that the two emperors who come before Justinian, uh, especially Zeno, uh, build up a pretty good economy, a pretty strong, robust economy, and which puts Justinian in a good position to take on all of his projects, like the reconquest of the West, the building of the Hagia Sophia. That he built a lot of other things as well. Um, but I would say that it doesn't leave the Roman economy really strained uh, because the conquests, which uh, he gets credit for, as well as uh, Belisarius gets credit for, are bringing more land back into the empire. And again, land equals revenue. And so although the conquering of uh, Africa, Italy, and parts of Spain does cost money, it's not exactly cheap, uh, it will eventually pay for itself. Uh, what happens with Islam, with, with the advent of Islam is not really that uh, the Byzantines are in a bad situation economically. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about this. The, the, there had been a Persian invasion uh, slightly before the, the invasion of the Arabs, which really disrupted uh, uh, not ju not just uh, was not just an economic disruption, but especially a cultural disruption for uh, for the Byzantines in Syria, Palestine, and Egypt. And I would attribute it more to that than than a bad uh, economic situation. As I say, when when you take back Italy and North Africa, those are two very very wealthy uh, regions, as we've talked about in the past, and then southern Spain as well uh, is. Has, has a decent amount of money in it. And again, whenever you're adding land, you're adding revenue. So I wouldn't say that uh, Justinian's projects put the empire in a bad situation uh, economically or otherwise. He's, he's considered you know, one of the great uh, Roman emperor. I, I think he's really the last uh, great Roman emperor. Um, but anyway, uh, appreciate those, those questions. Keep them coming. If you have a question, please leave it in the comment section and I will uh, answer it here on the show. So anyway, to get back into, to get back into the, I, I got so excited to get into the lecture here that I almost forgot the, the questions. Uh, so here we go. So, uh, in, in Italy during this time period, we are looking at, uh, as we said, Ricimer and then another guy named Anthemius. Here's a bust of Anthemius. And so basically what happened here, was you have yet another um, uh, uh, absent uh, opening on, on the throne in the West as we, as we frequently see uh, Western Roman politics are complete dumpster fire by this point in time. The entire Western empire is basically a dumpster fire by this point in time. Um, and so what the Eastern Roman emperor Leo is going to do is he's going to send Anthemius who is a general statesman, you know, guy who's rising up the ranks in the Eastern Roman empire. And he's going to go basically uh, uh, appoint him as the, as the Western Roman emperor. Now this does a couple of things for Leo. Number one, it gets a rival very, very far away from him because as we know, when you're the emperor, uh, East or West, you have to watch your back for palace uh, intrigues. You never know when, when someone's gonna try to murder you in your sleep. So this, this for Leo gets one of his rivals to the throne uh, out of Constantinople and, and hundreds of miles away. Uh, secondly, uh, Anthemius is a fairly competent guy. Uh, he's a decent general, he's a decent politician. And so as well, you know, for Leo, if this works out, he looks really smart and if not, well, you did your best. Um, and that's essentially what is going to happen here. Ricimer um, is part barbarian, as you can tell by his name. It's not a Latin name, it's a Germanic name. Although he's a pretty Romanized, obviously, he's a pretty Romanized uh, German, similar to uh, what Stilicho was, for example. Uh, you, can, you can see that these, uh, Ricimer was a, uh, a magister militum, which basically means like master of soldiers. Uh, and there were a number of magister militum posi positions in, in the Roman Empire at this point in time. But Ricimer really is, he's, he's almost like kingmaker in, in the West because although he himself can't really reign as, as emperor, 
um, he's he's basically he's basically the most powerful guy in Italy. And so, if anybody wants to be on the throne, they essentially have to have his approval, or at very least, be tolerated by Ricimer. And that does seem to be the case: is that Anthemius was basically tolerated by Ricimer. I don't. It really doesn't seem that these two got along very well because uh, Anthemius did attempt to fight back against the Visigoths and attempted to fight back against the Vandals uh, with seemingly a little success at first, but then as time went on, uh, he really began to stumble. And this was really when Rickmer took his chance and started going after Anthemius. And really, uh, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was that uh, uh, there was a disagreement between Rickmer and Anthemius over a certain uh, Roman... A senator, basically, there's a there's a trial, and and there was a disputed outcome of the trial. Name name's not really important here, and so Ricimer gathers up an army to go after Anthemius, and Anthemius holds up in in Rome, but eventually, Ricimer gets into the city and has Anthemius killed, and so Ricimer rules. He's, he's essentially the de facto ruler over, over what's left of the Western Roman Empire, which is not exactly a lot. And he's, and especially, you know, by 472, because he, uh, the, he dies basically, I think it's at six weeks after uh, he has Anthemius killed. So, so this is roughly the same point. And what's left of the Western Roman Empire is really not very much. It's, it's Italy and a little bit, a, maybe a little bits of Gaul. Uh, that are still that are still considered part of the Western Roman Empire at this point in time. Then a couple of years later, obviously there's more. There's going to be more chaos. There's more people who are on the throne and they're out of the throne, and people overthrowing, and so on and so forth. Uh, but. You do get in 476. Now, I, sh I should also uh, preface this by saying that um, the, the officially recognized Western Roman emperor is a guy named Robinus Augustulus, who's really, he's a kid. Um, he's not, uh, he's emperor essentially in name only um, over, an, I guess you could still call it an empire at this point in time, although it's, although it's, um, not not quite what it once was, <laughs> we shall say. Um, so, Odeker, uh sends a message to Zeno, who is the Eastern Roman Emperor, and he asked Zeno to recognize him as the ruler of Italy. Odeker basically, he offers his loyalty to Zeno, and he basically says that Zeno would have sovereignty over Italy, but Odeker would... Um, handled the administration of Italy. And Odeker is another one of the, he's, he, from what I've read about, it, it says basically all the, all that we know about him is that he was not Roman and that he was some sort of, he was Germanic of some sorts, but we're not exactly sure what. Um, seemingly some sort of generalissimo. He, I, he obviously has a military following. Um, but Zeno basically responds to him that he, I can't, he's, Zeno essentially says, I can't recognize you as uh, Odeker asked to be the king of Italy. And Zeno basically replies, I'm not going to recognize you as the king of Italy because you, you basically already are, um, which was kind of a wink, wink, nod, nod. Uh, hey, Odeker, why don't you go depose Romulus Augustulus and just tear the bandaid off? Because by this point in time, Zeno and the Eastern Empire, are, especially after the, the failed, uh, uh, Eastern Roman Armada, which attempted to take back North Africa from the Vandals, which failed in 468. It was basically, basically after that, the Eastern Empire was like, this is a lost cause, man. We got we to gotta cut our losses. Zeno does not want to expend any more resources on trying to, on, on trying to uh, get back or to, to revive the Western Empire, the, the Western Empire. And so Odeker basically, he takes the hint and he does in fact depose Romulus Augustulus in 476, which effectively ends the Western Roman Empire as a state, as a governing body, as a legal structure, as a military, it's, it's gone. 
by in 476. There are some people out there who I've heard say, well, did Rome really fall? How, how different was life, you know, for people out in the, you know, in Gaul and Spain? It, no, it's, it, this is real. It's, it, you know, let, let's not try to say things that sound sophisticated for our, you know, to get published. Um, Roman courts were no longer uh, around because there's no Roman state. Uh, the Roman governing body is gone. Uh, Roman landed nobility is still there. And they're just, they're answering to a different, to different rulers now. And many of them have been doing so for quite a while at this point, uh, especially if you're in you know, North Africa or, or Spain or Iberia. Um, But as, as an entity, it's in 476 that the Western Roman Empire just stops existing. And so, yes, there, yes, Rome does fall. It does have a definitive date because that is when every, every aspect of a, a state, which Rome had, at least the Western Romans had, stopped existing. Okay. All right. Now, Odeker is going to rule Italy from 476 till about 493, which is when uh, the Ostrogothic king, Theodoric I, invades Italy. Uh, that's in 493. You might have some, I've heard some people say Theodoric, Theodoric, doesn't, you know, essentially doesn't really matter uh, pronunciation wise. Uh, now the Ostrogoths, again, you know, cousins, so to speak, of the Visigoths, uh, had been settled in certain parts, you know, the Balkan parts of the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, never really integrated fully into into Roman society, and and uh, so under their their king Theodoric, uh, they go and they invade Italy in 493. Now, uh, Odoacer does get holed up in Ravenna. Uh, Theodoric does start to siege it. The siege goes on for actually quite a while because Ravenna is a port city, and Theodoric does not have a navy. So they can, uh, Odeker can still get resupplied by sea and it takes him actually a fair amount of time for Theodoric to uh, acquire a fleet to blockade the port. And then eventually uh, they do uh, come to some sort of agreement whereby uh, Odeker and Theodoric are going to split Italy between the two of them. And then at the banquet, at the feast, where they're celebrating the treaty, uh, Theodoric very politely murders Odeker with his own hands. So much for sharing is caring, guys. Uh, but that puts an end to Odeker and establishes the Ostrogothic kingdom in Italy. So again, there you have Amthenius. Here, so this this is, uh, again, I'm terrible at flipping the slides. Uh, but this is the, uh, the deposing of Romulus Augustulus by Odeker, as you can see there. Romulus Augustulus, uh, they're uh, about to drop his crown in front of Odeker. This is, uh, this is Theodoric. And so then this is essentially what the map looks like by about 493, right? So you have uh, the Ostrogothic kingdom, you have the Visigothic kingdom, there in Spain, you have the Suebi who are in kind of Northwest Spain. You have the uh, Kingdom of the Vandals, which is in North Africa and Corsica and Sardinia and the Balearic Islands. I believe it looks like this map is in um, German. Um, no particular reason why, just uh, this was the, the best visual I could find. And then you still have the uh, Eastern Roman Empire still there. Okay, so now that Western Rome is completely gone, I think we, it is appropriate to ask the question, so why does Rome fall? And obviously, like I said, this is, this is a very, uh, there's been a, a, a very, very much ink has been spilled over this uh, topic. And the, the kind of the argument I'm going to put forth today is it is a bit surface level. Obviously, you could write entire books, you can do entire podcast series on on why this happens, how this happens, and it's not really the central focus of the, uh, of what I wanted to do here in the series. But obviously, it's important to to cover this uh, just because it it go it, it goes along with the the topic. 
But so there is uh, a bit of a debate among historians as to, or, or I should say in recent years, there's been this, this debate between historians as to why the Western Roman Empire falls. One side says that the Western Roman Empire falls because of a, you know, this deluge of invaders, the, you know, the Goths, the Huns, the Franks, the uh, Saxons, uh, so on and so forth. And that Western Rome basically gets overwhelmed and, and they can't, they can't, you know, they can't plug all the holes in the dam, basically. You know, they, there's, there's like a dozen holes in the dam and they can't plug them all at the same time. Uh, and that is, that is the position that's taken by our guy, uh, Peter Heather here. And again, I keep talking about this book. It's really good. I plugged it on the Instagram and the Facebook uh, recently. Uh, Fall of the Roman Empire, A New History of Rome and the Barbarians. And so uh, Heather, among, among other historians, I mean, uh, he's not the only one who, who follows this line of thinking. And I've essentially agreed with him on this. That, that Western Rome basically falls because of the, of the deluge of invaders. However, there is another line of thinking that says that, uh, and I believe this, uh, I was, when I was reading about this, I think it says it comes from the Toronto School. Uh, but it says that uh, Western Rome doesn't fall because of the, because of the invasions. It, it basically, there, there's an internal collapse of the Western Romans. Um, and this is a position taken by a historian named Michael uh, Kulkowski, who was also, uh, Peter Heather was on the Barbarian series and Kulkowski was you know, on the Barbarian series as well. That one made by History Channel, which I grew up watching as a little, as a little kid. Uh, while everyone else was watching SpongeBob, I was sitting there with my historian father and watching you know, the Barbarian series. And every, you, know, you can go to school on Monday and everyone say, oh, did you watch that episode of SpongeBob? Oh, it was so funny. I'd be like, no, but I watched a really good documentary. Huh. I wonder why it wasn't very popular in school. Hmm. Still escapes me. Anyway, uh, but so Kulikowski disagrees, and I hate, and uh, he disagrees with uh, Heather on this, and he basically seems to think that uh, Western Rome falls due to internal uh, problems and not due to the not due to the invasion. And I hate to agree with fellow Polak. Uh, I am an ethnic Pole myself. My my family came over. Uh, to the states, I mean, many decades ago, but still, you know, identify with with the ethnic heritage here, uh, and so I, I do hate to disagree with a fellow Polak, but I'm going to, um, you know, because Rome Rome does survive a number of internal, really chaotic situations um, throughout throughout its history. If you look at the Roman civil wars, which which begin uh, with like you know, Sulla and 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 those guys, and basically only stops with, uh, with uh, Augustus, uh, Octavian. Um, that, it, it's, it's like a hundred years of civil war or something like that. I, I, don't, I don't remember the exact date, but, but Rome pushes a hundred straight years of civil war, um, which, which is a real dumpster fire of a situation where you have at, at that point in time, really some of, the, some of the highest quality Roman armies and what exactly are they doing? They're all killing each other. Right, that's that's a pretty terrible situation to be in. And had there been a serious ex, a serious external threat to the empire at that point in time, Rome Rome may have fell have fallen uh, then. You know, had the, had there been had this barbarian uh, migration happened uh, uh, at any point during the civil war, the civil wars, uh, perhaps perhaps Rome sees a fall earlier on. You think also about the the crisis of the third century. Now. I was debating. I, I was discussing this with my father earlier. Uh, uh, yes, this is this is what we do in my family. We we discuss the fall from um, and various other things. But uh, he, you know, and, and I mentioned you know the crisis of the third century as well. Rome is in a complete is in a complete dumpster fire of a situation uh, in in the crisis of the third century as well, and they still survived because there was not this large external threat. Now he does you know, he did bring up that there there, there are invasions. Uh, Rome does beat back invasions during the third century. However, you, you don't have situations where entire tribes are showing up at your doorstep, basically saying like, uh, can we come in here? We don't really know where else to go. And, and them getting to the point where they just basically start pouring across your borders, right? And I mean, we're not, we're not just talking about, 
know, a guy who's leading an army. We're talking about an in entire tribes of people, like 80,000 people showing up at, at your border. Is th that's a different situation. Um, and this is not to say, I mean, Kulkowski is correct that uh, the, internal <laughs> the internal problems for the Western Roman Empire at this point in time are, are severe. This, this is yet another, this is like a dumpster fire on steroids, okay? Uh, I'm not trying to say that the internal situation <laughs> of the Western Roman Empire during, during the fifth century was all roses and, and sunshine. Um, that's certainly not the case. But uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that the, it really it's, it is a bit of both. I, I hate to say, uh, oh, I, I, think, I think both sides are right here because I, I think really uh, uh, Heather's side is more correct about this than, than, than what Kulikowski says. Uh, but I mean, I do think that a stable and stronger Roman Empire probably can be back these these invasions but it's still it would have been hard it would have been very hard um but i do th i do think the uh the internal chaos of western rome at this point in time certainly contributes to um to the fall along with i think the more the more serious threat which was the which was the which were the invasions uh and it, I was reading as well, Kulkowski seems to think that this is like a, a, romantic, a romanticization of, of you know, the origins of Germanic people, which if you, if you, do, uh, if you do any reading on, on kind of the origins of, of uh, racial thought, there's actually, there's a really good book out there uh, by a guy named George Mossy called The History of European Racism. And it, it is true that there is kind of this, uh, uh, the Germans in the past have kind of had this like uh, romantic, um, um, almost like mythos about about the the Germans in in like the, the you know the, the Teutonic uh, spirit and the Teuton in the Teuton forest and all and all these things, um, uh, which which go, which goes to you know kind of the ethnic uh, uh, superiority of the Germans that uh, which again I, I certainly don't subscribe to, um, but what was used to push uh, a German ethnic superiority by, you know, obviously certain groups throughout history. Now, my case is that the, the fact that the, most of the <laughs> invaders are German has nothing to do with anything, really. Uh, if these were Celtic barbarians, the same thing would have happened. If these were Iranian-speaking people pouring across the border, the same thing would have happened. If, if the Huns had siphoned off, you know, uh, uh, half of the uh, uh, Western Romans <laughs> tax revenue, the same thing would have happened. Um, so uh, I certainly don't want to, uh, to subscribe to any, anything about, you know, any particular ethnic superiority here. Uh, I, I do want to read a couple of interesting points here that Heather makes uh, in, in his book. Um, let's see here. Uh, I, I, I found this part very interesting. So he says, this is on page 433. For most of the Roman West, however, the end was uh, pretty, actually pretty quick. On the emperor Anthemius's arrival from Constantinople in 467, Italy, much of Gaul, and a substantial part of Spain, Dalmatia and Noricum, still owed political allegiance to the Italian center. This made me think of a quote, I believe, I believe it's Ernest Hemingway, who I think when he was describing bankruptcy said that things happen very slowly and then very quickly. And that made me think of, of this situation because you, you see here in, in four, uh, again, 467, that's uh, uh, nine years before 476. Um, and, and you still have, it's, it says, much of Gaul, substantial parts of Spain, Dalmatia, and Noricum still owed allegiance to, to the uh, Roman authority. And then nine years later, it's all gone. So all the stuff we talked about in like 405, 406, and the 450s, that's the part where it's happening very slowly. And then the part that's happening in the four, uh, 60s and 470s is the part that's happening very, very, very quickly. Um, and then uh, Heather says as well, it is the fundamental thesis of this book that there is a coherent, 
that there is a coherence to the process of Western imperial denigration that unites this final collapse with the earlier losses of territory. This coherence, uh, this coherence stems from, sorry, coherence stems from the intersection of three arguments. And I'll, I won't read all of the paragraphs for this, but I'll, I'll read you know, the three points uh, that he makes here. So first, the invasions of 376 and 405 to 408 were not random events, but two moments of crisis generated by the same strategic revolution, the rise of Hunnic power in Central and Eastern Europe. Again, a case that I made. I was making this hit now. I, <laughs> I mean, there, you'll have to take me on my word, but I was, I was saying this before I got to this point in the book. Um, I did not read this entire book. I mean, you can see it's fairly thick. Um, I was not reading that. I did not get to this point in the book by, before uh, I started making that case here on the podcast. So Heather and I have basically come to this uh, uh, on our own conclusions. Um, you know, I, I authentically came to this conclusion and, and he's come to it, you know, through, through years of, through years of research. Uh, second, while some 65 years separate the deposition of Romulus Augustulus from the latest of these invasions, the two phenomena are casually connected. Uh, right, so basically the invasions lead up to uh, the deposition of Romulus Augustulus. And of course, of course, uh, I, I, it would be remiss if I didn't mention the irony of that, you know, the great first Emperor Augustus and the, the last uh, diminutive Rom, Romulus Augustulus, which is basically, um, and, and he shares a name with the, with the, with the founder, with the somewhat, you know, the mythological founder of Rome, Romulus. Um, but Augustulus basically means like the little Augustus. That's, it's a diminutive form of Augustus in Latin. Uh, and it's ironic that the last uh, Roman emperor shares the name both of the first emperor and of the mythological founder. And this is the this is the part as well. I might as well read this because I talked about it uh, uh, several times here during uh, uh, during the last couple shows. The damage inflicted upon West Rome Roman provinces by protracted warfare with the invaders, combined with the permanent losses of territory, generated massive losses of revenue. And again, I, I, I was, you know, taught this in college when, when we took classes on, on the fall of Rome, which I didn't, I didn't take a class specifically on the fall of Rome, but I mean, when you, when you study ancient and uh, medieval and Byzantine history, it's obviously covered. Uh, but this was, uh, this was a point that our professors who ironically was my father uh, uh, were making this point as well. And so I don't know, maybe it's genetic that I, that I agree with this, but he, you know, he also, uh, my father agrees with Heather on this, so we're all in agreement here. <clears throat> uh, the, Visigoth the Visigoths caused much damage to the areas around Rome between 410, or sorry, between 408 and 410. For instance, nearly a decade later, these provinces were still contributing to state coffers only a seventh of their normal taxes. So again, <laughs> as, as we say here, you know, uh, it's it's still it's astonishing to think about. I mean, Rome was Rome and its surrounding countryside were, were very wealthy uh, throughout you know, the entire history of the empire. I mean, goodness, it's the capital, uh, and, and that even a de even a decade after the Visigothic sect were only producing one seventh of the revenue was just uh, what what can you do? You can't you can't replace that. And then he goes on to talk about how this has effect on the military. So even temporary as well as permanent losses of territory brought a decline in imperial revenues, the lifeblood of the state and reduced the Western empire's capacity to maintain its armed forces. From Notitia Dignitatum, we see that already by 420, Flavius Constantius was making up for the field army losses incurred during the heavy fighting of the previous 15 years by upgrading garrison troops, not by new recruitment. The loss of North African revenues through the regime of Aetius further into crisis, generating a series of panic measures to try to keep the Western army and empire afloat. So again, you see here, it's, it says nothing about not having enough soldiers to recruit. The issue for the Western empire at this point in time is they don't have the money to pay soldiers big difference here because again soldiers are not going to work if you don't pay them nobody is going to work if you don't
pay them. If you at your job did not receive a paycheck for six months, you would leave it and find another job where you did not receive a paycheck. And then his third line of argument here uh, concerns the paradoxical role played by the Huns in these revolutionary events. In the 440s, the, area, the era of Attila, the Hunnic armies surged across Europe from the iron gates of the Danube toward Constantinople, Paris, and Rome itself. These exploits earned Attila undying fame, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Of much greater significance had been the Huns' indirect impact on the Roman Empire in previous generations. Again, I was making this point before I got to this point in the book. So I'm not just saying this because Heather is saying it. I, I came to this conclusion myself and Heather just you know, happens to make the same point. Uh, when the insecurity they generated in Central and Eastern Europe first forced barbarian, uh, various barbarian peoples across the Roman frontier. And while Attila inflicted huge individual defeats upon imperial armies, he never threatened the permanent alienation of a significant chunk of the Western Empire's taxpayers. Right, because the Huns caused both uh, the, the movement of the, the, of the Goths uh, as they come across in 476, or sorry, 376. And then again, they also caused the movement of the Vandals, Swavy, and Allens, uh, who come across between you know, uh, and New Year's Eve in uh, 406 and, and the, the more general migration of people between 405 and 408. And as we can see, again, this, this is just another, right? So this, this is going back to what I was talking about where in uh, 470 or 467, uh, there's, there's still a decent amount of, of land. Now this, this is a map from 440, um, but still, I mean, it, it, it doesn't change, drastic, change drastically between 440 and 467. Uh, uh, just going to show again that things happen very slowly and then very quickly. Um, but yes, so, so that is uh, a, a very cursory glance at why, at why the, uh, the Western Roman Empire falls. Again, you can spill a lot more ink about this. You can, I could go on for, for days talking about this. You could write, you can, I mean, certainly many people have written whole books about it. You can do whole podcast series about it, but there's, those are some of my thoughts about it. So I hope you found that, hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you found that interesting. If you've made it this far in the video, be sure to give it a like and leave a comment if you have any comments, questions, concerns. Uh, please subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss another video. Uh, go check out the, uh, the YouTube channel, Eastern Roman History. He's agreed to give me shout outs, so I will be, you know, I'll exchange, I will uh, uh, return the favor and tell you to go check out his channel. He also does Eastern Roman History, so if you enjoy what we, what I do here on this channel, you'll definitely enjoy what he does. He does some great work. Um, Check out our Instagram page, academics underscore 95. That's A-C-A-D-E-M-I-X underscore 95. I may be changing that name soon um, to, to match like you know, the channel and all of that. Uh, it was really just an Instagram account I had lying around um, that I used for like history memes. And then I kind of revived it when I decided to make the show. Uh, and you can also find us on Facebook. Uh, search Professor Run on Facebook. I'm, it, it should be there. Um, I'll, I'll be posting more on there. Uh, as we move into the future. I kind of abandoned the Twitter. I, I don't know. Just um, not sure if it's the best social media platform to grow something like this. Maybe it will be. Maybe I'll try to revive it later in the future. Uh, but as of right now, eh, the Twitter is there. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think that, that's really all I have for you today. I've, I've really enjoyed this. Now in the future, we are going to be moving really in an oriental direction. We are, we are going to be shifting our focus almost permanently to the east. We're not going to be really talking much about the We will talk about the west like when we get to the crusades and that kind of stuff. But for, for the most part, we're leaving uh, western history behind. So get ready for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. I've had a lot of fun with this stuff as well. Uh, so, and thanks for watching everybody and I'll see y'all next time.